Welcome to Module 6, our last module for this semester of Introductory Astronomy. In this video, we're going to start our discussion of the big picture ideas throughout this module by studying our own host galaxy, the Milky Way. Throughout this section and the next, we're going to learn all there is to know about our own galaxy and how we figured all of these different things out. Now, to begin with, we have to recognize that it is actually incredibly difficult to have understood to begin with that we are part of a specific structure that we call the galaxy. And in fact, that knowledge is only about a hundred years old, um, and it took quite a while to get there. So the first big scale attempt to map out our star's place within nearby stars uh, dates back to 1785. So the siblings William Herschel and Carolyn Herschel worked together to look in all directions with their uh, telescopes that they had and count the number of stars that they could see in each direction. In that way, they made a map where they could see more in some directions than others, but the big problem that they were running into is they couldn't say for sure that that's all there was out there. Instead, the big problem that they were having is that interstellar dust, the kind of dust that we learned about for the interstellar medium back in module four, uh, that was really, uh, module five, that was really causing a problem because all what all we could really see was how far in each direction our view extended. Kind of like if I gave you a flashlight and put you in the middle of a big um, old growth forest and I asked you to draw me a map of the trees. You'd be able to count how many trees you see in each direction and determine maybe whether you were on the edge of the forest or not, but at some point your flashlight is too dim uh, to keep going there's other trees blocking your view of more distant things, and all you can really say is what it looks like right around your location. And that wouldn't imply that you were in the exact center of the forest. It would just imply that you have mapped the extent that you're able to, and that's what this map was. So even back in the Herschel's day, they weren't suggesting that the sun were at the center of the galaxy, uh, but they identified that this was the best they could do. It was a great start because it was the first time anyone had really attempted to map in three dimensions our uh, galaxy, but we were going to need a distance measurement that went beyond counting stars or the parallax measurement that we learned about in a previous module. So it took a while. Uh, we're now thinking about the uh, 1900s. So Henrietta Swan Leavitt was part of a group of women called the Harvard Computers. Um, we have heard about them before when we talked about the spectral types. So the O, B, A, F, G, K, M spectral types for stars we learned about was put together by Wilhelmina Fleming, who was part of this group of Harvard Computers, uh, and uh, put into a better order based on star temperature by Annie Jump Cannon. So this was another project coming out of the work of these, uh, of these scholars, and what she was studying was variable stars. Now, some stars get brighter and dimmer because there is um, an eclipsing binary system or um, something kind of the blocking our view and it doesn't happen more than once. But what she was focused on was variable stars that actually get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer on a very consistent uh, time scale with a very consistent pattern. And she noticed something specific. When she was studying the brightest stars, those brightest stars took the longest to go from their brighter to dimmer to brighter again. And the um, dimmest of the stars in her set were taking a shorter amount of time. So the first of these to be uh, studied was Delta Cephei. So the whole category was called Cepheid variables. They are going to be the specific variable star that we focus our attention on. Uh, there are many different types of variable stars. Three are shown in the diagram here, including where they are in the HR diagram. So a couple of important things for us to think about as we compare our understanding to our larger uh, stellar evolution understanding from module five. 
These are all objects that have left the main sequence. These are stars that are no longer fully stable. They aren't turning hydrogen into helium in their cores. This is a specific category of star that once we lose that hydrostatic equilibrium, they get unstable in a very specific way. And when we see them get brighter, they are physically getting larger. And when we see them getting dimmer, they are physically getting smaller. So kind of moving um, diagonally on the HR diagram. And what we were uh, able to see with peak brightness and variability, what Henrietta uh, Swan Levitt was noticing was that the biggest stars took a long time to go through this whole process. Kind of like if you think about the ringing of a, of a big church bell, the ding, ding takes a long time because the whole bell just kind of has to swing back and forth. Whereas if you imagine the smallest bell that you can think of, a little tiny jingle bell, you can shake it and get a whole bunch of um, dinging all, all at the same time almost. It was that same kind of thing where the large stars take a while to go through this process. The smaller stars within this instability strip were able to do it much faster on the order of hours and days. So she noticed this pattern um, and the pattern she noticed was with apparent brightness, but with follow-up observations uh, done by other scholars to find Cepheid variables that had known parallax measurements, so we knew how far away they were supposed to be, they were able to convert that into a period luminosity relation. And the people doing that work to get the period luminosity relation were Einar Hertzsprung from the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram and Harlow Shapley, whose name we're going to hear a couple more times moving forward. But once we had this period luminosity relation, this became a very valuable tool to get distances to star clusters that have at least one Cepheid variable. So here's how that would work. In the upper left would be data we might gather from our telescope. That's the apparent magnitude, how bright it looks. It's getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. And for that upper left picture, I want you to look at the graph and um, pause for as long as you need to, to decide on your own how many days it seems like that particular uh, Cepheid variable example, how many days it is taking to get from a peak brightness to the next peak brightness. So pause if you need to. And hopefully you said about six days. The first big peak that we see is at three days. The next big peak we see is at nine. Um, it's not going to be exact, but six days is about right. So the way that this would work is we look at the period luminosity relation and we say, okay, six days shows up right around um, here. So in between five and ten. If we bring our attention up to where that would fall within the points that were known from parallax, then we can figure out that the luminosity of that star would be a little over a thousand solar luminosities. And all of a sudden, we can use the apparent magnitude that our telescope gives us and the luminosity that this relationship gives us, and we can determine the distance. By having that period luminosity relationship, we measure the period, we calculate the luminosity, and that allows us to get a distance that we would not otherwise have been able to do. So if you have any questions about that process, certainly let me know. It isn't a key part of our curriculum to do that process ourselves, but we want to recognize the value of this type of variable star. So Harlow Shapley, one of the people involved in um, kind of calibrating that period luminosity relationship, in 1917 applied that to star clusters in our general vicinity. So we hadn't determined that we had the Milky Way galaxy uh, in any particular capacity yet, but he was trying to show how to map out on a larger scale. So when we compare the 1985 Herschel map with Harlow Shapley's new map, he found that because these Cepheid variables are so much brighter and they're being um, studied within large globular clusters, so hundreds of thousands of stars, we only need one or two Cepheids and we can get the distance to that whole thing. What he's really doing is mapping out the globular clusters, but that still gives us a useful map where we are no longer at the center. And so if we look at this map, we notice that the Herschel map kind of sets the bounds on um, maybe a flatter region. 
that contains um, some dust. And then the uh, Shapley map shows that we're on the side, we're not in the center of that region, and there's definitely more stuff above and below us um, where there just aren't as many individual stars. So we started to get this sense that our galaxy is um, not centered around the solar system, and it's bigger than the Herschel map originally suggested. Since those first few attempts over 100 years ago, we have learned that the Milky Way is a barred spiral galaxy. We're going to come back to that idea when we start comparing types of galaxies later on in the module. But I do want us to think about the fact that we are mapping out a structure that we are unable to leave. If you think about um, any time that you've been on campus at GRCC, um, if you were stuck in the science building and someone gave you a clipboard and a piece of paper and says, make a map of Grand Rapids, where you have been stuck in the science center, you can't leave, you can look out the windows in all directions. That's kind of what we're doing with the Milky Way galaxy. We can look in all directions of our sky, but we have that one single perspective to work from. What we do think we've understood as of, you know, modern current time is that our galaxy has a flat disk where there is specific structure called spiral arms and a central bar. And the whole thing contains over 200 billion stars. So our sun is one of 200 billion stars within this specific structure that we call the Milky Way galaxy. And we call it a structure because it's all gravitationally bound. All of these things are kind of rotating in orbits that are consistent with each other. And it is a um, kind of defined entity within a larger region that we call the universe. So let's talk through these kind of key parts of the Milky Way galaxy. These are parts that you will need to distinguish from each other and that it would be a good idea to be able to draw um, kind of confidently from your notes or even from memory, just these three big um, key components. So the biggest part of our um, galaxy in terms of the relevance of it uh, is the fact that our galaxy has a flat disk, that there is a kind of primary region where we find most stars and all of the gas and dust, and it's all rotating in the same general direction, very reminiscent of the fact that all of our major planets all orbit in the same disk around the sun. This is just at larger scale. The disk is where we find the spiral arm pattern. If you have ever doodled a galaxy um, in the corner of your notes, or if you've ever used a galaxy emoji, um, often they are kind of highlighting the fact that there are these spiral arms. That's in the disk itself, and we will talk about that pattern, that spiral arm pattern, before we leave this particular section of our discussion. There's also a central bulge that's kind of more spherical um, and has a little bit more chaotic orbits. That is also where the central bar is when we have a top-down view, which we'll see in just a little bit. Um, and that contains the galactic center and a specific object called Sagittarius A star that we'll learn about in the next video. And then what has started to become something that we understand more, although there's still a lot of open questions, is the halo, this kind of larger spherical region around the Milky Way galaxy center that extends out much farther than we might expect. It um, doesn't have a clear defined boundary like this simple diagram shows us. It contains a lot of globular clusters, these large collections of hundreds of thousands of stars, um, and it contains a lot of dark matter, another topic that we'll be seeing in the next video, but we may as well highlight right now. If you haven't, I encourage you to draw a simple sketch in your notes where you at least identify the three main ob uh, pieces here, disk, bulge, and halo. Um, and we also have a top-down view next to a side view in case this is useful to draw for yourself as well. Where again, in both cases, the nuclear bulge is the central region that is a little bit, bit more um, chaotic than the disk itself. The disk, we see these spiral arms, and when we look at it edge-on, we see that it is quite thin compared to everything else. 
And if we notice in both cases, the sun's location relative to the center is shown and we are not near the center of the galaxy. We are closer to the edge of the galaxy than we are to its center. Our distance away is about 26,000 light years. That means that if we see something happening in the central bulge, we're really looking 26,000 years in the past and that light has taken a long time to travel to us. So, I talked a little bit about why mapping the galaxy is difficult, but I want to make sure that we feel confident understanding this. Dust blocks our view. That was a big problem with the Herschels in the 1700s when we're trying to use visible light that continues to be a problem, which is why we have to add in our understanding of infrared radiation and radio waves. Uh, distance methods are often indirect. We have so far learned about parallax, which is a direct measurement. And we've learned about Cepheids, which had to be calibrated with parallax, so they are not a direct method. In a later part of the module, um, when it becomes more relevant, we will talk about other distance methods. But again, they are calibrated on previous methods, and it all comes down to parallax as being the only kind of direct measurement that doesn't require the calibration of something else. And then whether or not it fully sinks in, we have to put in our notes and in our brain that it is not possible for us to leave the galaxy. If you ever see an outside view of the Milky Way galaxy, it is not a true picture of the Milky Way galaxy. It is either an artist's rendering, um, which would be relying on the most up-to-date science, or it would be a picture of a similar galaxy, but a different galaxy um, in its entirety. So when we see this picture, for example, uh, it is an artist's conception. It is an artist's rendering of our best understanding of where the spiral arms are, where there's more material and less material, where the sun is. And you'll notice, um, if you look closely, that we've kind of put this grid on the picture as well. And that grid is specific to our location, very human focused, where it's looking in different directions relative to our point of view and distances away from us. So it is a valuable way to think about where to look for things in our sky, um, but we want to recognize that that grid is centered on us not because it's the center of the galaxy, but because that's where all of our telescopes are. And if we look in detail at the Orion Spur, and this second image is kind of flipped um, 180 degrees from the original one, uh, we'll notice that the sun is indicated and the Orion Nebula, which came up in our slides a couple of times when we learned initially about emission nebula, that was our prime example, and when we learned about star formation and stars forming in clusters, we returned to the Orion Nebula where there are many stars forming in the center of that gas and dust. It is simply one of the closest examples of this type of nebula, not necessarily the only one or the best one, but just extremely close to us. If you look across the rendering, you can see there are lots of little pinkish red spots. Those are all emission nebula locations of ongoing star formation. Lots of other things listed that we don't need to talk about in detail, um, but just kind of recognize that all of the names of the arms, uh, Cygnus arm, Perseus arm, Sagittarius arm, those are based on the direction, the constellation direction that astronomers were looking when they first identified that as a separate piece. Um, it doesn't have anything more to do than that. So let's talk about the spiral arms before we end this particular section of our lectures. So a first guess might be that the main two arms come from two larger, denser gas clouds that kind of wrap themselves up because in the same way that in our solar system, the closer planets orbit faster and the farther planets orbit farther uh, slower. Um, that is also true throughout the disk of the galaxy. Stuff closer in has faster orbits. Uh, the sun takes about 220 million years to go once around the whole galaxy and stuff farther out would take even longer. So if we had two initial clouds of gas and dust, they would intertwine and, and twist up uh, sharper and sharper as the age of the galaxy continued. Now we can rule that out 
as a possibility because we can study other galaxies. We can study galaxies at different distances away from us. And so we're getting snapshots of galaxies at different ages. And there is no pattern between how much spiraling we see and how old the galaxy is. So this idea is thrown out entirely. Instead, the arms are a ongoing source of star formation, and they are a spiral density wave. If you have ever done the wave in a sports stadium or a concert venue, uh, we had that kind of animation of people way back in um, our discussion of waves back in chapter five of module three. If you've ever done the wave, you'll have kind of raised your hands in your seat as the wave uh, passes you, and then you put your hands back when the pattern is gone. The spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy, that is the places where the galaxy currently has its arms in the air, it's shouting, it's excited, it's making stars, and that pattern moves past um, as stars finish forming and a new region is able to um, start forming stars. And because it's a shock wave, uh, it is the source of new clouds of gas and dust um, collapsing and forming stars. So it's self-sustaining. Uh, it isn't just that the galaxy hasn't gotten tired yet or bored. Uh, it is self-sustaining, so it will continue to allow for that star formation to happen. So this image here is M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. It is not a barred spiral galaxy, um, but it does show us that really nice... Uh, spiral arm structure, and if you look, all of those pinkish red regions that we can see um, for emission nebula, so the location of hot young stars, um, are following along those spiral arms. So the spiral arm pattern actually moves slower than the stars themselves orbiting. So although it is a lot easier for us to pull from our memory, um, us sitting in our seats and the, and the wave passing us by, the stars actually move into that um, pattern and out of it um, as the pattern itself is a little bit slower than their orbits. So orbits uh, and how stars are moving give us a sense of masses contained within the galaxy. Orbits were how we are able to study binary star systems and determine if there's a hidden neutron star. Orbits are how we can get a sense of uh, the planets and Kepler's laws and how they move because of the sun's mass. So um, we're going to finish off here with having talked about the spiral arms so that we can focus on the mass content in the galaxy in the next video. So thanks for watching, and I look forward to continuing our discussion of our home galaxy, the Milky Way.